Good evening. I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting of the Salem Housing Authority to order for Monday, January 23rd, 2023. Will the recorder please call the roll? Commissioner Nishioka. Here. Vice Chair Phillips. Here. Commissioner Gwynn. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Hoy. Here. Commissioner Nordyke. Here. Commissioner Varney. Here. Chair Stapleton. I'm here. All righty, will everybody rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Vice Chair, do we have any additions or deletions? Not tonight. Great, thank you. Is there anybody signed up for public comment? No, thank you. All right, and Vice Chair, do you have a motion for the consent calendar? I move consent calendar, which consists of 3.1A, which are the December uh, 12th, 2022 Draft City Housing Authority minutes. And that concludes the consent calendar. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, second by Nishioka. Thank you, any comments? Seeing none, would the recorder please call the roll? Commissioner Nishioka. Aye. Vice Chair Phillips. Aye. Commissioner Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Hoy. Aye. Commissioner Nordyke. Aye. Commissioner Varney. Aye. Chair Stapleton. Aye. Motion passes, thank you so much. So we have no public hearings today or special orders of business, but we do have an information report. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Nicole Oots. Thank you so much. Good evening, I'm Nicole Hughes. I'm the Housing Administrator for Salem Housing Authority. And tonight we've gathered a presentation just to get, provide a little additional, more details about our program management report for everybody. So, in the course of throughout the year, in the 12 months, we'll provide with what is called a program management report. And in that report, it'll have statistics about our different operations and departments within the agency. So during the course of this last six months, we were able to um, do some restructuring that was approved through the commission. And we've actually strategized into two departments, one of which is the operations department, and the other is uh, development and, and strategy and design. In the operations department, we have the tenant-based voucher program, which is commonly known as the Section 8 program, and you'll see many of the statistics that are listed monthly in that report. And a little bit of information about that. Some of the statistics you'll see, we remain about 92% occupied in that program. And the reason for that is, is that the 25 households that we are serving is actually fully utilizing all of our funding. So you won't see us increase in that. And it doesn't mean that we have additional vouchers or that we should be opening up our voucher waiting list. It just means that we are fully, we've utilized all the funding that we have received at this time. Um, of those 2,500 vouchers, that's about 8,000 plus individuals that we're serving with that program alone. It also includes that we pay out about $2 million a month in housing assistance payments throughout the city of Salem and Kaiser communities. And in a year's time, we're reaching about 24 million, close to 24 million in total housing authority payments. So quite a bit of housing assistance payments being made through, um, and all of that funding does come from housing and urban development. The other program in our voucher department is what we now call the special programs, 
We've gone away from not necessarily only calling it the Homeless Rental Assistance Program, but we also now call it the Special Programs, and we're integrating all of our specialty vouchers that we receive within our agencies. And many of these are vouchers that we actually apply for and um, have to qualify for through Housing and Urban Development. We've been extremely successful. We have a great grant writing team and a great management and executive team that's done great work to make this all happen. Um, so we currently have what are called mainstream, non-elderly and disabled. It doesn't really tell you by the name of what that is, but we are still working to, to fill all of those vouchers. And presently we have, um, through this program, we also have utilized all of our emergency housing vouchers, which you've probably heard in the community. Um, we have received 34, and we fully utilized 34 in collaboration with um, referrals into the agency. So that uh, many, many different agencies haven't been able to fully utilize those. So we're, we're, we have a great collaborative effort in this community to make that happen. We're continuing to apply. We've applied for stabilization vouchers, which is what we consider as possibly our next emergency housing voucher program. That funding comes with additional barrier removal, is why we're backing out some on the homeless rental assistance and pulling forward with the use of the vouchers instead of the city general fund to be able to pay for the rental assistance. We wanted to say through the homeless outreach team and the specialty programs that nothing's really changed. Every day they're out there. Um, they're still continuing to make connection. We're still, um, you'll see through the program management report how many different visits they make. Um, and we've updated the information to reflect the new type of program. And we hope to provide you with some details of what a day in the life with our specialty team is so that you can see what happens out there for them. One thing I wanted to say is that they were successful just this last week. Um, they were able to coordinate and get approved four people from, or four different households, and three of those were in the micro shelter pods. So uh, four people will be moving in as of Friday last week, and that is all through efforts of vouchers and different specialty programs without uh, city funded assistance. But three of those are actually coming from our micro shelters, which has made it tremendously easier for our, our team to be able to locate individuals and get them connected to the right resources. Our landlord navigation is also in that program. A landlord navigator spends all day on the phone connecting to landlords in the community. And she has really connected and made um, uh, good connections for individuals that don't have um, that, bar they have that barrier of either credit, evictions, and different things to be able to connect them to the right landlords and get their information out there more quickly. That is why we've been able to use, uh, we've had a 70% success rate with our voucher program. Um, compared to presently in Oregon, there's anywhere from 30 to 40% um, voucher success rate. So we're having pretty good success rate with our vouchers. We'd love to see them all get utilized. But that can, um, sometimes there's multiple barriers or reasons why individuals don't lease those up. Our family self-sufficiency program is thriving. It continued to thrive through COVID. And there's continuing to make great connections and getting individuals. That's a five-year program that's totally voluntary. And those individuals, any increases in their rent goes into an escrow account that then earns them money. At the end of the five years when they graduate with that, many of them have had upwards of anywhere from fifteen to $20,000 escrow checks that can go towards the purchase of their new home. Our property management team continues to grow as we continue to build and develop. We're up to 14 different apartment complexes and over 700 units. And we're excited to bring on more and continue to develop. So uh, of that team, just be aware that we only have uh, seven mechanics that are managing all of those units as a lead mechanic with the help of contracting out services and six property management coordinators that are running that entire portfolio. And then, of course, our front desk staff, which is client-centered. And at our front lobby, we have kiosk system. They help coordinate individuals to any of their needs. It won't turn up here. There, it finally did it. It just was freezing. 
And our other side of the, uh, what we did in our strategic planning was separate our two operations so that our development and strategy side can actually physically spend the time to ensure that our agency is fully compliant and able to look out for the next development out there in the horizon and become creative and innovative. So our development team is out there to build or redevelop our property. Um, in past meetings, you recently heard that we're working to preserve two of our senior complexes. That is something that our development team would be working on. Um, they're also fully engaged in the Sequoia Crossings and Uquina Hall project and ensuring that those are done on time and that we're meeting our tax credit obligations. Um, the assistant housing administrator of the development and strategy oversees our finance department, which through this strategic plan, we've been able to grow that team and it's um, vastly improved the service and delivery of our financial uh, reporting, audits and different functions that they have to maintain, including those $2 million payments to all the landlords out there. Um, compliance uh, with 14 different projects. We answer to multiple different investors, um, multiple different banks, different um, compliance authorities such as Oregon Housing and Community Services and Housing and Urban Development. Um, their job is to ensure that we're fully compliant at all time. And then of course our information and technology, we've been able to grow that by one additional staff member for a network analyst and um, they maintain our full infrastructure for IT. Oh, there we go. Through our capacity building and strategic planning, we've been able to recruit five additional of those positions. Uh, that includes our Assistant Housing Administrator of Operations and Assistant Housing Administrator of Development and Strategy. A grant analyst, which has been a huge improvement to our delivery of invoices and ensuring that all of our grants are maintained and on time properly. Um, an IT manager who is extremely busy maintaining multiple different structures in all of our systems and satellite offices, and a maintenance foreman. Um, we are currently under recruitment and hopefully be listed shortly as a communications program coordinator. We're excited about this position as we help to continue to provide better communication out into the community about what Salem Housing Authority is and what we do out here. Um, future recruitments, as we continue to build these teams and have management in place, we hope to have additional development team members and a compliance program coordinator. Also tonight, we just wanted to give you an update on Yaquina Hall and South Fair Development. Um, you Yaquina Hall is on the bottom right hand corner. As you can tell, we're, we're quickly seeing the finish line of this project. Um, the, we are probably about 89% complete at this point. We're excited to say that every window has arrived from New York and they are all installed now. So um, that was a huge hurdle to overcome for us. Um, we're presently working on the meter situation for all to bring power to all of those units. Our general contractor has done a phenomenal job with very little power to this building during this entire construction project. Uh, it's coming together. It's bringing back the beautiful, historic, uh, old building into a more modern facade, and we can't wait to show it off in a grand opening event this spring. Uh, South Fair Development, uh, which is on the upper side, uh, we added two additional ADA units, and those were quickly filled as soon as they were completed. Those are one-bedroom, fully uh, accessible apartments. And so that apartment complex is completed and it's fully leased up as the end of December and we're excited to see all the, the, the children were so excited to see the new playground come to life and, and made a great big thank you note to the contractors. So everybody out there um, is really enjoying the new uh, development. And then the much awaited Sequoia Crossings, which is a 60 unit permanent supportive housing complex. Um, you can see by the aerial photo we are well underway and I can tell you from the time that photo was taken a couple of weeks, two, three weeks ago, we now have foundations and plumbing going in and it's cruising right along. So we're excited to see that one also come to life. 
A look ahead to 2023, we um, will be finishing Yukona Hall, the completion of uh, the spring. We're looking at a grand opening event in March or April. Um, establishing additional public-private development partnerships. So, as you know, we've brought to forth tax exemption programs and hopefully in the next year we'll also be bringing a, a forward special limited partnerships. This helps us to grow our affordable housing tax credit portfolio without us actually being the developer of the project. We're undergoing a software conversion through all of this and it's coming along smoothly. Uh, the staff is super excited to get rid of our 25 plus year old hardware and bring into the new uh, era and that will actually streamline our capability and I think our customer service will only improve with it. Um, the moving to work transition, as many of you know, we were accepted as a housing authority for the moving to work program. It's a very exciting time for us, so you'll be seeing many more. Um, we'll actually be bringing some presentations regarding this to you to um, help educate the community as well as going out to community events about our moving to work demonstration. The community engagement program creation, that's a part of our um, ensuring that we're getting out our word of what we're doing out there, attending neighborhood events and making sure that um, our staff is also connected to the community in other ways to be able to answer questions and fully understand what is we have to offer at Salem Housing Authority. Um, and then the much awaited beginning process of rebanding. Um, we were, were getting through our strategic planning process and now we're looking ahead to possibly middle of this year to being able to start the rebranding process, which means that we are looking to take uh, the Salem Housing Authority name and rebrand it into a new revitalized name that um, meets the community needs, but maybe doesn't have authority in the name itself. And then, of course, construction of Sequoia Crossings will continue through the entire year of 2023, and we look forward to a grand opening event in January, 20, January February of 2024. And that's the conclusion. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much. That was really great to be able to see pictures of what um, it looks like on the inside of some of those locations and really get a good feel for what's coming up next. Um, are there any questions? Can I guess Commissioner, are we commissioners now? Yes. yes. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, thank you. Um, Nicole, thank you for the information. Your department does great work. The, call, the, the question I get asked is, and they don't know how to phrase this, but they're gonna, people ask, how long is it gonna take for me to get housing if I'm new to Salem? So what's the answer? What do people hear as a response? Once they reach our Section 8 waiting list, we estimate anywhere th from three to four years. Uh, most of our programs, including, I will tell you that Yukona Hall, we're excited to say that Yukona Hall is actually in the process of us starting lease up, um, which means we've hit a, a, a paragon point of we're actually getting to the finish line. We have to be within 120 days. And um, within hours of us opening that waiting list, we had 500 applications for 52 units. Commissioner Nordyke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you as always for the information. It is so exciting to see all the new programs in the works, and I know how hard your staff are working, so please extend my gratitude to your entire team. My question was about the community engagement program. What can we as commissioners do to connect Shaw staff to mem uh, members of the community, neighborhoods, businesses, or others who might want to partner with Shaw in welcoming uh, the groundbreaking of new, uh, whether it's new apartment complexes or other public housing in the neighborhoods, how can we integrate our public housing tenants into these communities would be another way of phrasing it. So our goal with our strategic and, and innovative and creative is to get out there and see what individuals are also seeking from the housing authority and get their ideas, believe it or not, some of these individuals are the most creative individuals for us to help us. Uh, form the next project. So our goal is to get our communications team member on board and then start connecting through different databases such as Facebook, Instagram, 
um, all the social media and ensuring that our website is fully functional and up to date and hopefully bringing back information that you can also help share at different neighborhood association meetings um, that maybe we're not also attending, but we hope to have graphs and info reports that are able to better depict about what we do and what the timelines are to make that happen. Thank you. And if I may ask a follow-up, I know that sometimes when folks hear that there's a new apartment complex moving into their neighborhood, sometimes there's a lot of fear or unknowns about new tenants moving in next door. And I'm wondering if there are ways that we can, again, just connect the existing community members with the people who are about to arrive so that they feel that they're not just walking to an apartment complex, but that they can talk to the neighbor down the street they can get to know the local coffee shop, the barber shop, things like that. Is there anything that we as commissioners can do to help make those connections and ensure that our public housing tenants feel truly a part of the Salem community? Absolutely. We and every new move in, we actually invite everybody to the neighborhood association meetings and ensure that they know where those are located and how to connect with those. But in the future, we hope that our community spaces can hold neighborhood associations or be a part, a bigger part of that. Maybe a coffee and talk session or. Um, some sort of event that's held there so individuals can see our sites and and what the Salem Housing Authority is all about one of the common questions obviously when we start to go into a development process and speak out is there's a level of concern about what our projects are about I, I would encourage anybody to go out and see any of our Salem Housing Authority sites um, we blend in completely with the neighborhood. Our goal in customer service to the clients that live there is that we're better than anybody around us, that we keep them, maintain them at a higher level of expectations, and that our sites are not say anything about public housing authority. They simply have a normal apartment name. We do that on purpose to blend in with the community and let those that live there be a part of it as well. I had a quick question for you. Um, you mentioned that we were adding some ADA units um, or, or redoing them. I'm not sure. Maybe you can clarify for me. But I know some of our um, some of our complexes are older. So do we meet the current requirements for number of ADA uh, mm -hmm. units for each location? And then are we thinking about expanding that to even uh, have more access um, than even what's required of us? Absolutely, we're always looking to add. Anytime we do a preservation project, we make sure that we have the minimum code requirement, but we always look to see if we can add additional. But I can tell you that we knew there was a need in Salem for um, ADA units, and especially one bedroom ADA. We know this because of the individuals that are having a hard time finding these in the community are those vouchers that are not getting utilized. So we took a, um, a daycare facility that was underutilized and not being um, being used at South Fair Apartments and transformed that into two ADA apartments. Um, there was formerly a Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Head Start on site at South Fair and they uh, outgrew that location and left it many years back. We attempted to bring in private daycares and were not successful um, long term and so we we as the housing authority, we're, we're experts at housing, so we decided to take that building and turn it into two ADA apartments, and they were immediately leased up. Thank you so much. I think that's really important, um, important work that we're doing. Any other questions? Oh, city manager. Just quick, quick comment, no questions, Nicole. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation, and I just wanna let everybody know how valuable it is to have the housing authority in-house to have a willing and capable development partner in-house and on the payroll is an extraordinary thing. So thank you for that. Sequoia Crossings or, and Redwood Village, two examples that would not have happened without that relationship, so thank you. And we, we look forward to many more. <laughs> right all right, well thank you so much. Thank you for all your work. Please pass along our gratitude to your staff. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.
Board Member Stapleton. Here. Board Member Nishioka. Here. Board Member Phillips. Here. Board Member Gwen. Here. Board Member Gonzalez. Here. Board Member Hoy. Here. Board Member Nordyke. Here. Board Member Varney. Here. Chair Hoy. Here. Thank you. Councilor Stapleton, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Not tonight. Thank you. We have nobody signed up for public comment for the URA. Uh, so, Councilor Stapleton, the consent calendar. Yes, I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Thank you. The consent calendar today consists of a few things. We have item 3.1A, the December 12th, 2022 draft urban renewal agency minutes. Item 3.3A, it's the authorized use of unallocated $4.5 million in McGillcrest URA funds for 22nd Street Southeast Realignment Project. Item 3.3B, uh, the Urban Renewal Agency reappoints the um, applicants listed in the facts and findings sections of the North Gateway Redevelopment Advisory Board. And that concludes our consent calendar. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilor Nishioka. May I make just a comment? Certainly. Is, that, is this the time? Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say that I'm <clears throat> very excited um, about the McGillcrest project. This has been something long in coming and has had a lot of efforts put to it. So I just want to comment uh, thank you to all of the city staff. And um, even though it will be a busy time and the construction, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? If the recorder will please call the roll. Board Member Stapleton. Aye. Board Member Nishioka. Aye. Board Member Phillips. Aye. Board Member Gwen. Aye. Board Member Gonzalez. Aye. Board Member Hoy. Aye. Board Member Nordyke. Aye. Board Member Varney. Aye. Chair Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. And we have no public hearings, no special orders of business, but we do have one information report. Any comments or questions Any, or anything from staff? Your mic's not on, there you go. Kristen Rutherford, Community and Urban Development Director. I'll just point out that the um, there are a couple of items within the administrative purchases. One is um, funding for the Streetscape project. So um, just reminding everybody that that is continuing to be rolled out annually throughout downtown. And you will continue to see that project touch different block fronts over the next few years. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, seeing no further business for the Urban Renewal Agency, we're adjourned. And I will call this meeting of the Salem City Council for Monday, January 23rd, 2023 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Councilor Stapleton. Here. Councilor Nishioka. Here. Councilor Phillips. Here. Councilor Gwen. Here. Councilor Gonzalez. Here. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Here. Here. Councilor Varney. Here. Mayor Hoy. No one noticed. Here. It is I. I also vote aye. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Stapleton, are there any additions or uh, deletions to the agenda? Not tonight, sir. All right. It's time for council and city manager comment. Do we have any? Councillor Hoy. I've been asked to share, been asked to share a, a true story. Um, it is called The Mud on My Shoes. Life as a City Councilor, January 22nd, 2023. Commissioner Bethel asked, if I come back tomorrow and can walk you into housing, will you go? The homeless woman, a former RN at Salem Hospital who has been down a dark path involving domestic violence and drug use, which led to crime and the loss of her license to practice nursing, replied, there are others who need to go before me. If I leave, they'll die. The woman has found a place to practice, to do what she loves and is lost. Her hands were black like coal, and she was visibly cold. The number of campsites we saw while canvassing Wallace Marine Park in Polk County in the city of Salem yesterday blew my mind. The park measures some 114 acres, and I would venture to guess that the unmanaged encampment there takes up about 90 to 100 of those acres. There is an estimated 200 million pounds of trash on site, which is clearly polluting the waterways. It is a place of poverty, crime, and unthinkable things. 
The situation is massive. No one, no one has an accurate accounting of the population living there. While I have tremendous respect for persons like the woman we spoke with, the nurse who feels needed and obviously cares deeply about her homeless neighbors, the situation is unsafe and it is inhumane to continue programs which perpetuate it. A lot of money is being spent. What is it actually doing? If the desired outcome is to get folks housed, they need first to live. They need things like mental health help, serious addiction counseling, and at least the opportunity to experience minimal accountabilities and reasonable boundaries before housing. If there is nowhere to take them, we better get what they really need together and deliver. They should not be allowed to stay where they are. One person at a time, we can do this, and it doesn't have to take years. The mud on my shoes is dry now. I'll bet the same cannot be said for countless others living, surviving, and slowly dying in Salem's once beautiful Wallace Marine Park in Polk County, Oregon. Thank you, Counselor. Any other comments? I will just uh, report out uh, some activities from last week. I was very pleased to be able to address the Local, um, I was invited by the NAACP to address the Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration on Monday. We hosted Senator Wyden at the airport uh, last week and also met with Representative Salinas to talk about our, uh, our priorities here in the city to try to garner more funding from the federal government. I was able to uh, participate in an introduction to politics class at Willamette University where I got to speak to uh, about 25 students about what it's like to be the mayor. I participated in a flag raising ceremony at the Salem Airport, which was really a really a moving experience. And the city manager and I, uh, along with sta other staff, uh, met with Northwest Human Services to talk about how we can work better together uh, delivering services for our homeless population and others. So just wanted to mention those things to kind of let you know some of the things that are happening. Councilor Nordyke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm now on week three at my new job at CASA of Marion County. CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates, and we represent abused and neglected children across Marion County. Tonight, on my way out the door at CASA, I met several volunteers, and the fact is we need a lot more. The last numbers I checked show we have about 351 children in care right now who have foundings of abuse and neglect across Marion County. As of right now, we have 96 volunteers. The need is great. And if you are at all interested in learning how to partner with us, either as one of our CASAs or another form of support, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. We know that the pandemic wreaked havoc on our students' mental health. We know that it was a challenge for a lot of families who found themselves suddenly dealing with unexpected layoffs or illness or deaths related to the COVID virus. So we are seeing a huge need in our community. We are particularly seeing a need for bilingual volunteers. We need folks who can speak Spanish as their first language. We need folks who can offer lived experience to our children. We need folks who can reflect the face of children in our care. So again, if you do have an interest, this is one of my many pitches for volunteers. We hold trainings four times a year. So if you're not able to join us for the trainings underway now, we will have our next round of trainings later this spring. And I'd be more than happy to connect to you with my incredible staff at Casa Marion County. The time commitment is about seven to 10 hours a month once you get through our 30 hour training program. And of course, we guide you and provide support emotionally as well as an investment of our time every step of the way. You will not be alone because our whole point is to ensure that our children are not alone. So if you are at all interested in learning more about us and our organization, please reach out to me. And our website is casamarionor.org. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to add in Spanish, necesitamos voluntarios que hablan español como su primera lengua para los niños en la sistema justicia. Entonces, llámame. Thank you so much. Thank you, Counselor. Other comments? Counselor Stapleton. I just want to highlight the pit count that's coming up. I believe we still need a lot of volunteers. 
Um, I know Mickey, uh, sorry, Counselor Varney has signed up to go out, um, and I'm planning on signing up to go out with her. Um, and I'm sure many of our other counselors, Mayor, I know you have gone out in the past and are planning on again, um, Counselor Roy, many of us. So um, we would just love to invite the community out to help us out with that. So this Saturday is our next big day here in Salem. Uh, you can go to the mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance. Uh, if you just Google mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance, you can find the sign-up page there. Thank you for highlighting that, Counselor. Counselor Nishioka. Yes, just as a follow-up, I'll be going out tomorrow, and at the training, um, they were saying they needed hundreds of people to still volunteer, so um, I think the need is great. But if anyone is willing to do it, sign up. Thank you, Counselor. Are there other comments? All right, we have no proclamations, we have no presentations, but we do have public comment. So I apologize if I get your last name incorrect. Uh, Mr., let's see, Mark Ottenad. Please uh, state your name, your address, or your ward if you live in the city at, uh, for the record. And you have three minutes. The yellow light will flash uh, when you have one minute to go. Whoops, you need to hit the little button there. Uh, there you go, got it. Thank you, Mayor Hoy, members of council. My name is Mark Ottened. I serve as the Public and Government Affairs Director for the City of Wilsonville, which operates the South Metro Area Regional Transit Agency. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Wilsonville City Council to request your support for House Bill 2662 which would undertake an uh, Oregon Department of Transportation uh, study of extending the West Side Express Service commuter train from Wilsonville to Salem with stops in Donald, Woodburn, and Kaiser. The bill essentially is a study bill. Um, what would it take to extend the West Train? When the West Train was originally started in the early 2000s, it was expected to continue on to Salem and that that would make it successful because you would be connecting two metropolitan planning areas, the Portland Metropolitan Planning Area and the Salem-Kaiser MPO. And so it would qualify for potentially additional uh, funding opportunities to the FTA, Federal Transit Administration. The purpose of extending or studying the West Extension is to provide our commuting public, our residents, our workers, another transportation option. At this point, chariots, Salem-Kaiser Transit, and SMART exchange uh, routes uh, during the course of the weekdays and Saturday, the 1X bus. However, as we all know, I-5 is often a traffic jam, usually at the Boone Bridge near Wilsonville, um, and therefore, all of us would benefit if there were a um, non-highway public transportation mode that could move our workers and residents back and forth between our areas. For the city of Wilsonville, we have 21,000 jobs, and 5% of our workforce actually comes from Salem-Kaiser. I'm one of those myself. And so this was an opportunity not to actually fund the extension, but to study it. What are the issues with, for example, the last mile connection? Where could the um, commuter train come into Salem. We might need some more cars to run more frequent service between the Salem area and the Portland area. Currently, West goes from about 15 miles from Wilsonville all the way up to Beaverton, and there you can connect to Max, go on into either Hillsboro or Portland. So it would be an, a unique opportunity to have a high capacity transit option, and we would know more about what the cost would be in terms of if we ever did want to fund that down the road. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your comment. <clears throat> Are there any questions or comments from Council? I look forward to discussing this later on our agenda. I will let you know that we did pull up from our consent calendar, so it'll be under item number five, special orders of business. So if, you were, if you're staying for that item, it will be a little bit later in our agenda. I apologize. Okay. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. All right, we have Diane Chavez. Nope, that turned it off. <laughs> Sorry, there you okay. Go. There you go. Um, thank you. I'm Diane Chavez. I'm in Ward 1. Um, and I'm here just today to support two good items that are on the City Council agenda today. And one is 3.3D, which is to approve community pass programs. Um, to me, this is a no-brainer in Salem, but we need more, more pedestrian walkways, more bike paths. It would make Salem safer. Um, it would 
um, make it a better place to raise children and to, to live. Um, so that's clearly something I think is a yes. Um, the second one is this rail study. Um, I've often wondered why there isn't a better public transportation all the way up and down the West Coast, um, especially between Portland and Salem. Um, when I lived in New Mexico in 2003, they established the Rail Runner. Um, this is a quote. This is what their their website said at the time. The history of this is to provide safe and effective regional transit services, reduce congestion, crashes, and pollution caused by single occupant vehicles, extend the life of the state's roads by reducing traffic, provide transportation alternatives to residents, particularly transit dependent groups such as seniors, youth, low income, and mobility impaired residents, provide as residents with better access to education and higher paying jobs, um, reduce oil dependence. 20 years later, aren't these all things that Oregon needs? <laughs> um, and certainly today, we need that. A round trip ticket now on the Rail Runner runs from Santa Fe to Albuquerque runs $3. Um, it runs 12 times a day. It stops at every commun little community between Albuquerque and Santa Fe and on down to Berlin. Um, it's with the population of New Mexico being about half what Oregon is, I'm not sure why we don't have that in here <laughs> um, and why, but it seems like something we should certainly study and certainly pursue. Um, I know at the time there was a lot of obstacles and complaints to the project. It was going to cost too much, it was going to impact certain neighborhoods negatively and so on and so forth. But 20 years later they've got good bus connections to the airports, to the train station, to the universities. Um, it's a good project, and it's still working. Um, I think we need to support a project like that. I think at this point in time, with our climate situation the way it is, we certainly also need to look into the possibility of um, electrification of this project. So, thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate mm -hmm. it. And we have one person uh, testifying remotely. That is Tammy Myers. Go ahead and turn on your camera and introduce yourself for the record. Reminder, you have three minutes. Do we have Tammy? No. So Tammy is no longer with us online. Great. Thank you. So we will move on. Um, Councillor Stapleton, the consent calendar. Yes, I move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of items 3.3D, pulled by Councillor Phillips and item 3.3F pulled by you, Mayor Hoy. Second. Great, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and try and read all of this here, bear with me. We have item 3.1A, the January 9th, 2023 draft city council minutes. Item 3.3, or sorry, 3.1B, the January 17th, 2023 city council work session minutes. Item 3.3A, ground lease with On Any Sunday, Inc for city-owned real property located in the 1100 block of Edgewater Street Northwest. Item 3.3B, addendum to purchase and sale agreement with Discount Nursery Supplies, LLC for the real property located at the Salem Business Campus. Item 3.3C, agreement for transfer of real property from the state of Oregon. Item 3.3E, amendment to lease the Salem with Salem Kaiser School District 24J for city-owned property located at 360 Commercial Street Northeast. And that concludes our consent calendar. Thank you, Councilors. Is there any discussion? Will the recorder please call the roll? Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Varney. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Nishioka? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. Councilor Gwynn? Aye. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Councilor Hoy? Here. Aye. Hoy. <laughs> and Mayor Hoy? Aye. <laughs> Motion passes. All right, we are on to public hearings, item 4A. And for that, we have Michael Brown. And I'll just read the quick uh, script here. The Salem City Council will now conduct a public hearing concerning amendment number six to the 2019 annual action plan reallocation of community development block grant COVID funds. The hearing will begin with a staff presentation and I don't believe there's any individuals signed up to testify. Thank you.
Could you hit that button for us, please, just to turn that? There you go. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Michael Brown. <clears throat> I'm the Financial Services Manager for the Urban Development Department. And the purpose of this public hearing is for reallocation of community development block grant funds that were awarded to the city as part of the CARES Act. And of course, <clears throat> before spending any HUD money associated with community development block grant or home investment partnership, all of those have to tie back to the city's consolidated plan. When <clears throat> and I put up the four priorities in the city's consolidated plan that you've seen probably many times before. The annual action plan, of course, is the, is the annual plan that implements the consolidated plan. And right now, I think we're in year three of this existing plan. Uh, the amendment that you're considering is greater than $50,000 and therefore triggers the public hearing as part of the citizen participation plan. And it, op <clears throat> it affords the opportunity for public comment. Uh, with that in mind, there was one public comment that was uh, provided from a Mr. Heron, Mike Heron in Ward 7, who says, I support the reallocation of CDBG monies to the Meals on Wheels program. So specifically, there is just one item to consider for council tonight, and that is um, several programs that were originally started when the CARES Act was first passed and then later in mid-2021 when we got another tranche of money. Some of those program projects that were uh, awarded at the time did not come to fruition for various reasons. And so there is, for lack of a better word, leftover money. And uh, there's a desire to spend it. And the city has a good partner in Marion Polk Food Share who've already successfully spent $170,000 of CARES Act money uh, for this on the city's behalf. So staff is recommending that that allocation money of $279,000 and two, <laughs> $279,260, I'm not sure why it's cut off there, um, be awarded to Marion Polk Food Share for their Meals on Wheels program. <clears throat> when that money is fully spent, then the city will have spent its $1.6 million allocation of uh, CDBG COVID money. And we will come back to you and report in September, hopefully, when that is closed and uh, have results then. And uh, the project is pretty much underway now, so it's just a matter of when council approves, then we'll be able to increase its funding and um, Marion Polk Food Share will be able to serve the community. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> I was surprised to see that, that the Salem Housing Authority was uh, turning back $100,000 as a part of this. Do we know why we weren't able to spend that money? I can see Ms. Rutherford uh, reaching for the mic there. My understanding is that they received other funding that offset this. Thank you. And then the other thing that I couldn't quite tell from the staff report, I looked and I, I may have just missed it. What specifically will the food share be doing with the money? Does it just supplement their budget or is there a specific program or a specific new thing they're doing with it? No, it's just a supplement to what their, or their existing program. Uh, I mean, they've outlined some details with respect to how many more clients served? These are all things we have to report, of course. Uh, but it's essentially, it's just supplemental funding for something that they're already doing and doing well. Thank you. Are there other questions? Councilor Nordyke. Thank you, Mayor. I had a couple questions as well. I wanted to first just make sure I understand the process better. I know we have voted to approve CDBG funding. And I know that according to the staff report, the projects that you have bullet pointed the Shaw Mortgage Assistance, the St. Francis Shel Shelter Rental Assistance, and so on, that those projects did not come to fruition. But my question is really about what was the process thereafter? Because once you realize you had this extra money, an extra almost $280,000, 
how did we arrive at identifying the food share specifically for those funds? And the reason why I raise it is, on the one hand, I'm a huge supporter of Meals on Wheels, and I've driven for them multiple times. But on the other hand, the projects that we intended this money for was not for nutrition assistance. It was for shelter, mortgage assistance, uh, a little bit towards childcare training. So this is a reallocation to a very different type of need, a need to be sure, but very different than the types of needs that we had originally chosen to allocate these funds to. So while I'm extremely supportive of supporting the food share and Meals on Wheels as best we can, I just wanna know how did we choose, how did staff come to reaching this particular organization out of all the other potential CDBG awardees? Uh, thank you for the question. There were two primary factors. One is that this particular tranche of money is specifically tied to the CARES Act and to COVID. So therefore, the operative words that I have drummed into my head from HUD over and over again is uh, prepare, prevent, and respond to COVID. So with respect to the programs or the projects that did not come to fruition, some of the difficulty that they faced was actually finding clients that you could still today uh, make that tie into COVID. Whereas the food share has that ability and does that quite readily. <clears throat> the other driving factor was um, the desire, frankly, to find a partner who was successful and who had a program that could, or a project that could spend the money with and get it into the community and into the community's hands. Okay, may I ask a follow-up? Certainly. So I just wanna know, did we notify any other potential awardees about this $280,000 or so that was available within the confine? I, I understand you can't give the money out for just any cause. It has to be within the CARES Act restrictions. I'm just wondering, did we give other potential awardees a chance to apply for this 280,000? Uh, <clears throat> the short answer is yes. The federal programs managers who have their hands directly with the, uh, with the city's partners did do a reach out um, by necessity with, this is not a huge amount of money. So to run a whole new uh, grant funding opportunity would be a big lift considering how little there is and also considering the desire to spend it. Um, but yes, they did reach out to some of the other partners and this was, there's, it's, not a, it's not a science, it's an art. And so as a consequence, um, this is the staff recommendation. Other questions? Oh, thank you, Ms. Rutherford. Yes, I need to correct the record because I misspoke because there was another $100,000 of general fund monies, which is what I was thinking of when I talked about there being other funding that they're being used. So um, there's $100,000 from the general fund allocation that we are also processing that Shaw is not using. The mortgage assistance funding, I wanted to circle back and speak to that. Um, that money was not used because there just weren't enough individuals that met the qualifications of the program. Thank you, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the money I was wondering about, yeah. the mortgage assistance. Thank you for correcting that. Other questions? Councilor Nishioka. Not to keep asking basically the same questions, but I'm just wondering why St. Francis didn't meet the qualifications or didn't have the need. Does anyone know? The program man, <clears throat> I'm sorry that you've got the B team tonight. I'll just apologize up front. Normally you would have very capable people, either <laughs> Michelle E. Hanger or Miss Tiffany Otis who deal with this. Uh, directly, but Ms. A. Hanger is working for economic development now. Ms. Otis is in a training in Washington, D.C., so you are saddled with me. <laughs> the team is fine. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. It's, you're very kind. Um, but, and that also made me forget the question. St. Francis. St. Francis. Francis, yes, St. Francis. Um, the federal program managers have worked with every partner, but also with St. Francis quite diligently to try to um, help them be successful and my 
with the report that I got was that St. Francis was having difficulty finding clients who could meet who the qualifications, the okay. particularly with the COVID tieback. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, I'll close the public hearing. Councilor Stapleton, do you have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve minute number six to the 2019 annual action plan reallocating 279,260 to Miriam Polk Food Share Meals on Wheels. Second. Any discussion? If the recorder will please call the roll. Councilor Varney. Aye. Councilor Stapleton. Aye. Councilor Nishioka. Aye. Councilor Phillips. Aye. Councilor Gwynn. Aye. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. Item 4B. The Salem City Council will now conduct a public hearing concerning Supplemental Budget 1 for an unanticipated city expenses related to operation of the City Medic Unit. The hearing will begin with a staff presentation. Any individuals that are testifying are limited to three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open a public hearing. And I see Mr. Eggleston, our CFO, is here. Good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. I'm Josh Eggleston, Chief Financial Officer for the City. I have a few brief slides for you to walk through the action recommended for you this evening. A public hearing is required due to the change uh, being more than 10% of an individual fund. As you may be aware, the city has been operating a single medic unit as needed to bolster our contract transport provider Falk. This unit is operated by the same fire department firefighters using overtime shifts. This action involves two funds and I'll walk through both of those. The first fund is the emergency medical services or EMS fund. As the medic unit operates and transport patients, those patients are billed for the service. The revenue is recorded in the EMS fund. The projection through the end of the fiscal year is approximately 3.55 million. You'll see that there on the top. To offset the revenue, we need to add 2.15 million for bad debt expense. As with any provider in the healthcare industry, the city bills the full rate to patients or insurance carriers, and often the contract or allowable rate is much less than the billed amount. The difference needs to be expense, expensed as a bad debt that won't be collected. The other amount is being added as 1.4 million for a transfer to the general fund to reimburse the overtime staffing costs to operate the unit. In the general fund, we recognize the transfer from the EMS fund as revenue and appropriate the funds to the fire department overtime budget. In conclusion, staff recommends adoption of resolution 2023-3 and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Eggleston. Other questions? Councilor Nordyke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Your mic, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Josh, as always, for the succinct and clear report. I appreciate it. So the staff report says that the transfer will reimburse a general fund for firefighter overtime expense. Can you give us a general sense of what this overtime was for? Was it for, for example, unusual incidents? I know we had a fire that we had a number of firefighters respond to just outside of Salem City limits. I'm just wondering if there was any sort of unusual event that prompted this. Yeah, good question. Uh, the only thing would be the operation of this medic unit. So it's a, it's an overtime shift that the department staffing. So it's nothing unusual. They're just having this extra shift uh, staffed with overtime. Basically to provide another ambulance in the city. Correct. Falk is having difficulty staffing and this helps bolster to make sure we have enough ambulances in service. Other questions? Councilor Varney. Thank you. I was just wondering, what is the current situation? With uh, staffing in the unit? Good question. I'll defer to the fire chief. We have Chief Niblock here. Chief, if you'd turn the mic on and introduce yourself for the record, please. Yes, fire Chief Mike Niblock, thanks for the question. Current situation is uh, Falk has been able to staff their 14th medic unit. Um, they are just getting ready to complete their contract negotiations, which should help them better recruit employees. It's been very difficult uh, to recruit uh, in pretty much any emergency services. Uh, the last couple of years, we're struggling in the fire department, dispatch, medical services, police, everybody's having troubles. 
So their contract will help them have a better opportunity to be competitive in the market. Um, we would like them to add one more medic unit to get to 15. And so we're right now we're balancing the difference between the 14 and our additional medic unit that we're staffing. And we're looking at the numbers every week. Um, it's my intention to take it out of service as soon as possible. Um, but I also have to balance that with having the right number of ambulances in the community to serve the public when they call 911. So we're trying to find that that good balance and we've been doing that week by week. So Chief, just to clarify, when you say the 14th unit, do you mean on duty at any particular time or what do you so mean So that's that? 14 total units in the system during a 24 hour period. So there's peak periods of the day, you know, 10 a.m. to two o'clock where, where we're busiest because people are out moving around driving their cars. Eight o'clock in the morning we're busy because people are driving to work. Uh, five o'clock we're busy because they're driving home. And then at nighttime it slows down as people are in their homes and they're not out, out and about as much. Um, but we still run calls then. So we, 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 we vary the number of ambulances in service, but, but 14 refers to the total number um, that they can have in at peak operation, which would be 14. Thank you. Other questions for the chief or for Mr. Eggleston? Councillor Phillips. Yeah, um, I, I saw the numbers earlier, but I don't fully understand them. Like in simplicity, where are we moving money to and from or from and to? Like, is this coming out of the, the general fund? Um, and, and what is the total after you get the money from the, the, the fees that you actually do collect? What's the amount that we're, we're approving tonight? Uh, really good question. So, the, the, so we're adding uh, revenue and the corresponding budget authority in the EMS fund. Uh, and that includes a transfer to the general fund to cover the overtime. So there's two different, two different actions, two different steps. Uh, that 1.4 million should cover overtime through the end of the fiscal year if it's needed. Um, but as far as the EMS fund, we believe we're covering costs with the billing, uh, but it's pretty close. So yeah. Josh, I think the counselor is asking you, where's the money coming from? Uh, so we're billing patients for the transport. So that's where the new revenue is coming from because we are operating the ambulance. We bill for the service as opposed to Falk running the ambulance and billing for the service because it's a unit that we're running. We get to bill it and then it gets to supplement to pay for the firefighters to run that ambulance. I guess my follow up question that I'm just missing is, is like, are we close to being whole with what we're getting in fees? I, I haven't seen the latest analysis, but I think we're breaking even okay. with operating the med medic unit, even with overtime. Yes. And I guess it'd just be a comment like, yeah, uh, as a person on the front lines of healthcare, like it has been really bad the last few years. Burnout is incredibly high. So, I mean, I don't know if this is just for safety's sake or if it's in part also to prevent burnout, but I think that this is incredibly important. I just wanted to understand it better. Thank you. No, those are great clarifying questions, Councillor. And if you'll remember, we, uh, we upped the, the fees that we allowed the ambulance to charge for all of the reasons that we've been talking about. We did that just recently. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is there any way to improve the amount of bad debt or lessen it? What, what, how does that happen? Uh, not really. I mean, it just depends on uh, the patients that are, that are picked up and billed. So it's really uh, whoever calls, we answer. It really depends on your payer mix. So if you have private pay insurance, they, they pay what we bill. If you have Medicare and Medicaid, they're capped. So it doesn't matter what you charge. You, you pay the allowable amount that Medicare or Medicaid will cover. So that might be $400 or $500. If you bill 2000 or 10000 it doesn't matter. The balance is bad debt write-off. One little follow-up. Is there any data on who's just not insured at all but receives services? Yes, but I, 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 I'm trying to drill down to what, what your question is there. Um, yes, we have people who are who we receive treat we provide treatment for who are uninsured and they end up being in the bad debt right up they're uncollectible so if we transport someone who has no address no means of paying we still treat them we still take them to the hospital they still receive care um, but they're but they're a bad debt write off they're they're not collectible if you will thank you councilor nishioka thank you mayor hoy so um continuing on with this when we see the bad debt uh, Medicare write-off, which is, again, it's because it's capped, you bill the standard fee, but you can only only get paid what Medicare will allow. Are the bad debt that have no billing 
capability, is that included in this Medicare or is that a different section? I'm just curious if it's all. That's, the, that's a total of, of our bad debt, right? Total off, bad debt. We, we budgeted for the year. Typically, we don't transport, so our, our budget for this is very small. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, when we start transporting right away, of course, we have more bad debt write offs, so we have right. to increase the a budget authority to be able to balance the budget. Thank you. Other questions for staff? All right, we'll close the public hearing. Councillor Stapleton, do you have a motion? Yes. I move we adopt resolution number 2023 3, uh, fiscal year supplemental budget one, increasing emergency medical services fund and general fund resource and expenditure appropriate. Sorry, I can't even. This is quite the mouthful of a <laughs> sentence. Um, the authority for. Um, Unanticipated revenue and expenses related to operations of the city medic unit. I think I got that all. Second. Ooh. Any discussion? If the recorder will call the roll. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Gwynn. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. All right. On to special orders of business. We are at 5A, which is a presentation from the Salem Parks and Rec Advisory Board, their annual report and presentation. And I see we have Dylan McDowell, the chair of our Salem Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Thank you for joining us, Dylan. Please hit your button there to turn the mic on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let you me don't just have get to this down pulled so up. far. You, if you don't. Sorry, I just got to get this up. Sure. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, Council. Wonderful to see you all, and uh, really wonderful to be in person. I, I thought I was beyond the mute button, but we still have that. So. <laughs> um, my name is Dylan McDowell, and I'm chair of the Salem Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, or more commonly called SPRAB. I'm very excited to be here tonight, and I just want to extend my gratitude to Mayor Hoy for making this possible um, for us to be here as a, a special order of business rather than just public comment. And I know, uh, speaking on behalf of the full board, that it's really nice to be able to have this time and look forward to having some conversations with you all. Council, this is just so you know, this is a little bit of a policy, or not a policy change, but a procedure change. In the past, we had been requiring our advisory commissions and board members to sign up under public comment, but we're changing that practice. And Dylan is the first one to do that. So welcome. Thank you so much. Um, so tonight, I'm going to start by going through our 2020 work that we did and you all had a, an annual report in your packet that you should have had a chance to review and I'd encourage you to look at that later if not um, the city staff did a really wonderful job putting that together and then i really want to focus most of my time on our goals for 2023 we're doing some different stuff this year really going into a, more of an out public outreach trying to do some more research and really increase our roles which i think you'll all be excited about I thought I would start with just some basics about SPRAP. Um, I know, you know not, as, not all of you might be as familiar with SPRAP, so I thought it would be helpful to have just two basic slides on the background. Um, so this is our duties, mission, and vision, focusing on the mission here. We advocate for the acquisition, planning, development, preservation, protection, and enhancement of Salem parks, including their natural resource trees and recreational opportunities for current and future generation through the input from the community and advice to council. Um, SRC Chapter 13 is what governs SPRAB, and we have nine members, one of which has to have a horticultural background, so we always have a tree expert on the board. I saw this slide for the first time at our retreat, and I thought it was really interesting just to get a brief history of SPRAB, and I thought you all might enjoy just to know that and it was in the 50s that there was the first public park advisory commission in Salem, uh, but it wasn't until 76 that we had bylaws, and it looked similar to the form that we have today. So really almost 50 years ago that kind of took a similar form and as you'll see in just a moment we're still evolving but it's all good in 2022 we had a few different activities that we undertook so first off is master plans you may know that master plans come through SPRAB before they go to council and so we hold uh, we have a process to review those have public input and engage with neighborhood associations there is always a member of SPRAB that is a liaison to the master planning processes as well so there was Bailey Ridge Park, which was approved by SPRAB and moved on to council. We submitted letters of support for funding opportunities. This is something we've been trying to do more of in recent years, is really helping staff uh, in their application for grant proposals. I know there's going to be two that you're going to be considering shortly as well. Um, so making sure that we're lifting that up. So as staff and are seeking funding from the federal government, from community aides, et cetera, that they have that stamp of approval from the Salem Parks and Recreation Advisory Board showing this has been vetted and has that community angle as well. So another way to kind of lift up our voice and try and support this process 
We collaborated on the Salem Park Improvement Fund grants, or SPIF as they're called. So this is an opportunity for neighborhood associations to apply for enhancement funds. And so we have SPRAB representatives that lead that process with staff, or participate in that process with staff. And then we explored opportunities to increase our impact with all of you, one of which was asking for a space like this where we could give you an actual presentation. So excited to see that uh, moving forward. We had our first retreat in October, first in, in a long time, I should say, since 2020. Um, and it was really wonderful to have time to meet and actually meet each other in person, many for the first time. Um, Mayor Hoy, you were able to join us at the start. Thank you so much to share some of your vision for as mayor and just our role going forward into the next year. And we really focused the retreat on how can we be more effective as an advisory board? What are the roles we can take on so we make sure things aren't, we're not just kind of there observing things that they pass through, but being more proactive on research projects, being more active and thinking about issues that are going to come up, engaging with you all as council. And we adopted some, some new goals and a work plan um, at our January meeting just a couple weeks ago. So I'm gonna focus on a few of those to let you know some of what's to come. So the first bucket is advising city council. So we wanna make sure we're here at least annually, either in the December, January timeframe like this to talk about what happened in the year past. And then also coming back if there's pressing issues that might be important or ways that we can be of service to you all as an advisory board. Second is working with you all on a, a SPRAV liaison. I was very pleased to hear that Councillor Varney is gonna be our SPRAV liaison. It's wonderful to have, have you coming back into the fold as someone we can work with on that. So very excited to work closely with you in the next year and find ways to making sure information we're hearing from the community is going through you and, and things are coming back to SPRAV. Um, finally, really working a little bit more on the budget lines. So we've moved up this part of, the, of our presentations from staff in our calendar year, so we're more aware of budget items um, and trying to find more ways that we can be making recommendations to staff and to you all for things, whether it's taking advantage of federal funds, park ranger operations, things like that, parks maintenance. Um, so you're aware of some of these funding lines and that can be part of your consideration going or into the budget fiscal year. Public engagement is a big one. Um, I think it's safe to say the community at large is probably not super familiar with SPRAB and it's something we've been wanting to change is just getting our, getting our name out there in the sense that there's an opportunity for more people to, to share feedback about parks and recreation that we can then obviously filter through to you. Um, so one of our goals now is each SRAB member is going to present annually to at least one neighborhood association. And this is going to be an opportunity for us to give information about SRAB, um, about different opportunities in the community. So I'm working with staff, um, Rob's over there and others, that we're going to work on some actual presentation materials and fact sheets that our members are taking when they go into the communities. So that way we, we're all working from the same set of information. Um, include everything from basics, you know, we have 91 park properties in Salem but also talking about the timeline for SPIF grants. And so if you're a neighborhood association, making sure everyone knows this is when you apply, this is how you get the money, this is how much you can get. So that information is, is going out there. And really most importantly, it gives those neighborhood associations a chance to give us feedback and to tell us what the issues are in their parks. We can then bring that back and make sure staff are aware of that. And then finally, looking at social media, website, and other kind of board member opportunities just to elevate the role of parks and recreation in the city, in our community, and in the different public channels we have. So I know there's some really good ideas underway for this. Um, something I worked with staff on over the last year and with the board is, is making some updates to the website, just including some basic things about how many park properties do we have, having more of a landing page. So it's been nice just to see some of those go into effect, and I think we have a, a lot more we can do. And then finally is research projects. Um, we are trying to be, as I mentioned, more proactive in trying to assist city staff with our role as an advisory board. So one of the big ones is the climate action plan. I was able to serve as the SPRAB liaison throughout the process, and we have a nice set of natural resource goals that we all wanna take on as SPRAB, looking at how can we look at other cities, other best practices from nonprofits, national organizations, et cetera, to bring in some ideas for staff to consider as we're looking at things in the plan, such as urban canopy, urban tree commission, native planting, et cetera. We also want to be taking on emerging issues. So right now I'm serving with two other members of SPRAB looking into e-bike and micro-mobility micro devices and park regulations. So micro-mobility, think scooters, for example. Um, but thinking about what are the regulations that we should have there. And so we've been looking at cities everywhere from Bend to Boise, Idaho, um, and even further national orgs, like I mentioned, to see how, what are these processes and what should Salem try and learn from as we're creating something. 
And then finally, trying to take on more direction from all of you. As there's different projects that come up, if there's different ideas that you all want researched, um, we can be out on the front of that. One of the best ones, the best opportunities is going to be the update to the parks master plan in the city, which will follow the TSP process. So we want to get out in front and think about how can we make sure we're researching that now. So when the city starts that up, we're ready to go with a lot of ideas and SPRAB is there to advise. So with that, I just want to thank you all again for giving me the time, and I would welcome any thoughts or feedback from you all that I can take back to SPRAB, and we can continue <coughs> discussions. But in general, I hope you all reach out if there's ever any questions you have about parks or recreation. Well, thank you, Dylan. Thank you for your presentation, and I really appreciate your leadership for, on the SPRAB. I think it's really um, it's notable and remarkable, and I really appreciate it. Thank Other questions so for Mr. McDowell? Yes, uh, Councilor Barney. Thank you so much for the presentation. I look forward to spending more time with SPRAB again. Um, I'm really, boy, it's impressive. The goals that you have set out for 2023, I really appreciate the outreach to the community because I feel that's really, really crucial. Um, I mean, SPRAB has this defined direction and uh, I, I, I think it's, I'm really excited to work with all of you. The funding, the research, um, this is going to be great, so thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Councillor Stapleton. Sorry, <laughs> I saw her first. No worries. Um, so quick question for you. One, yeah. all of the things that everybody has said. Uh, you're fantastic. This presentation was great. Um, I look forward to uh, many years of this and, and maybe even from more of our um, advisory boards. Um, question about your connection with park volunteers. Um, I know that we have a volunteer coordinator within the city, but is that connected at all with what you all do? And and yeah, I, I'm thinking about things like invasive plant removal, yeah. um, that type of thing. Is there a connection there? It's a loose connection at best right now. So actually mm -hmm. one of the um, rules, roles and responsibilities that we have for this coming year is that we're asking everyone to participate in at least one volunteer event in the city. Mm -hmm. So you basically, your roles are uh, one, you have to be part of one planning process or research project, one volunteer event, and then one neighborhood association presentation, kind of the three big things. And the volunteer event is exactly that. We're also looking at, um, are there some kind of awards or recognition we could do as SPRAB for city volunteers and for city staff as well that are out there on the parks really enhancing them. And so we, uh, we've talked about this. We have two members actually looking into it right now with whether that's like a monthly thing where we have recognition or if it's an annual award and how that would tie into the community awards that the city already has. So trying to find a way to really elevate and recognize those people. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Nishioka. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Hoy. Dylan, I want to say I was so impressed with the report. And I know that Salem loves their parks. And parks are really something that I feel Salem can continue to just let shine. So again, Thank you for this great report. It was really forward thinking, well organized, and all of you have done an excellent job. I think that the work that you're looking at doing with communicating um, is going to be incredibly helpful because it will get your message out and there are citizens out there that will be knocking at the door to help. So I just really wanted to say thank you very much. This was wonderful. Thank you so much, Counselor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nordyke. Thank you. I definitely want to echo the kudos from my colleagues, so please extend my gratitude. I know, Councillor Varney, you were in leadership at SPREB. Thank you for your leadership there. I'm so glad you'll be continuing to serve in another leadership capacity. Uh, but also thank you to you, Dylan, and everyone else who's been on SPRAB. Uh, I do have some questions specifically. You know, families who cannot afford to rent out a party room for special occasions will often turn to their parks. And I love the concept of our parks as a true low barrier or no barrier community space for anyone and everyone. Uh, what will SPRAB do to ensure that we can support parks in low income neighborhoods? And not just making sure that they're available and that the grass is cut, but things like, you know, uh, picnic benches, mm -hmm. gazebos, other kinds of facilities, particularly in parts of the city where they don't have the lush tree canopy that Ward 7 enjoys. 
It's a really good question. Um, I think one of those opportunities is through the Salem Park Improvement Fund, and so part of that is getting the message out there to neighborhood associations, so they know that the funding is available that can then be enhancing that. Um, it's really important, I think, that those amenities come from the community in those areas. Uh, I, I was uh, reading about a park in um, Southern California recently, where they actually went through a big community process, and in that area it was a heavy, heavily Latino area, and they found that um, a pinata place was what they want, play to hang up pinatas in the park, was what the community really wanted. And that's then brought a bunch of people together. They created a whole setup that really centered that part of the culture and what people wanted. And it was something that, you know, if you come in with just a city planner, you might not necessarily get to that same outcome if you don't have the robust engagement. So I think starting with the, with the neighborhood associations and the SPIF grants and those opportunities is, is step number one. Um, and then I think step number two is looking at how we can just get some of the basic access to the parks in the first place. So thinking about um, one of the projects, Bill Regal Park, thinking about access points there is something that's underway. And um, it's really important that we make sure people can get to the parks. And then as we try and improve them, using our different sources of funding, whether it's SPIF, CIP, or other mechanisms, um, to make sure we're getting the amenities that they want in that community to make it as useful as possible. Any other questions? Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mayor Hoy. Um, I just want to thank you also, Dylan. Um, it's, I feel hope in your presentation. Um, I also feel I would be remiss if I did not um, acknowledge your pictures of Wallace Marine and Cascade Gateway Park from 1958 and 1962. Um, I want that. I used to take my kids to Cascade Gateway and I drove there today. The, car, the park is open, but the back half is not. And there were folks walking to an encampment back in there. Um, I was at Wallace Marine's situation on Saturday, and I, I wouldn't want to bring my grandson to either of those parks right now. I, it just doesn't feel safe. So I'm not sure where the parks department stands on that um, and what you can do about it or how we can help you as council. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that. And I, we've definitely shared some letters in the past and, and acknowledgement of concerns about the impact of encampments on the parks and uh, the number of trees that are being cut down, the fires, and, the, and just the damage that's being done long term, as well as the safety issue. Safety to parks employees has been a big concern as well. Um, there's been some really bad incidents in that sense. Um, I think ultimately, you know, in that capacity, our I recognize that is an incredibly challenging topic in terms of how, where can we provide support and resources, but also at a very larger systemic issue. We've had, um, one of the requests that we had in the past was regular updates. We were getting quarterly updates from Gretchen Bennett about the homeless um, response from the city. And so really we've been trying to plug in and stay informed of how to best be a part of that. And I know, Councilor Varney, you served on a task force early on about um, around food access and, and the homeless community. And so trying to find ways that we can plug in to be a voice for that to represent the parks, but ultimately recognizing that's a larger issue that you all as council are taking on and other asset aspects of the city. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Councilor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Dylan, and you and your group. You always do great work. Um, and I appreciate, you know, you reaching out to this council, having a liaison, wanting to, you know, sort of get a little closer to us. But any, any connection with the school district and the charter schools, the, um, uh, you got the kids there. Yeah. But also something I, I don't have, you know, I don't have this information, but what is, what is, um, what is out there for the teens? You know, there's just, there's this age group. You know, when you're younger, like uh, Councilor Nordak said, those uh, parks are saviors for people who have kids and it's free just to show up. But as the kids get older, their need to go to the park changes, and sometimes they don't want to go to the park. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, you know, some uh, a kid's jungle gym. Is there any thought given to what we can do for teenagers and that age group that we need to keep safe and engaged, other than just sports? Because sports become really an elite thing really mm -hmm. quickly you know, in this community. So anything on that end? That's a really good question. Um, 
I think it's one where we'd be really open to feedback of what what all could we be advocating for, or could we be looking at other cities? You know, I mentioned I was reading this case study on a, on a park in Southern California, trying to stay up on how our city's creatively using their parks and public spaces, whether it's, like you said, if sports are not the outlet, then are there just gathering spaces that feel more comfortable? Are there uh, art installations or things that maybe pull people in in a different way? Um, I think the city does a really great job with its recreational opportunities, and I think in terms of whether it's the the fun, the five Ks and ten Ks that happen throughout the summer, I think trying to find more of those so there's gathering points that kind of bring people together and get, bring them into the park in the first place is really important. Um, but I, I completely hear your concern that there you there's a demographic that potentially can be missed in some of that, and that should be maybe more of a priority for our thinking. So happy to take that back and and, and really ponder that more with the board and, and share that with staff. But I like the pinata idea. I mean, that blew my mind. <laughs> Councillor Hoy. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Um, if, uh, and I lost it, just went right away. It has to do with park rangers. How many park rangers are there for 91 parks? I believe there's currently only one still, yes. And so there's one, and his time is mostly spent between four main parks. And so this has been a topic that I believe it was a letter last year, the year before, of advocating for considering um, more park ranger funding. And I think as we think about some of these issues, even with um, micro mobility and bike access and e bikes and parks, and we think about things where there might be enforcement needed on top of other safety issues. Um, you know, the, uh, the ranger we have right now is a really wonderful asset for the city. We all, as Sprad, were able to take a birding tour with him. He's a very avid birder, so I would encourage all of you, if you're interested, to spend <laughs> some time with him. Um, but there's, I think it's a really big opportunity for us to find some community engagement from someone like a park ranger. So currently one, and most of his time, like I said, it was within the four major parks. Just to follow up, how many volunteers are there for parks? That is a wonderful question, and I would need a lifeline from some staff on that for an exact head count. See a lot of people looking around. We're happy to follow up, but we, Thank have a, you for that. we have a lot of wonderful volunteers. I'll say a I lot. I found a good question. <laughs> Thank you very much. I see Mr. Bechtel making his way to the uh, microphone. Good evening, Mayor and, Council, or Mayor and Councilors. Mark Bechtel, uh, Public Works Operations Manager. Uh, the number of volunteers really varies. Uh, we have the Mental Brown Island uh, Park Patrol. And I couldn't tell you just standing here at the moment how many people are on that patrol. Yeah, I think it probably varies from six to 12 on any given period of time. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, some other folks that volunteer consistently at Bush's Pasture Park, uh, helping with the, the rose gardens and the, uh, the formal gardens there. Uh, and then we have all sorts of organizations that volunteer in the park system. Uh, a lot of them very project specific, but uh, a lot of nonprofits, a lot of service organizations, churches, uh, just thousands and thousands of hours of, of time that different groups put in volunteering in the parks, and also individuals and families that still help out whenever they're available. So uh, I would make a pitch that uh, if you're interested in helping in the park system, uh, we have a volunteer coordinator who would love to uh, facilitate your desire to help in any way. And I do know that Betsy Belshaw, who runs the uh, Minterbound Island Park Patrol, would love to have more volunteers. Uh, it's, it's, that's kind of a grueling volunteer effort, uh, patrolling all those trails in, uh, in Minterbound Island Park. So we're always open for more volunteers. Thank you, Mr. Reckell. Anything else for Mr. McDowell? All right, well, thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate it. And please thank the, the entire SPRAB uh, on our behalf. Thank you so much. Thank you. On to item 5B, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. I move to direct staff to amend the scope of the Salem Transportation System Plan update to include the following. To set a clear goal of eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries among all road users over the next 10 years. Commit to Vision Zero within that same 10-year period and direct appropriate city staff to prioritize the work. Key city departments, including Public Works, Community de Development, urban, urban Development, and Police, shall be um, actively engaged as leaders and partners in the process of developing the Vision Zero plan, implementing it, and evaluating and sharing the progress. And the city shall facilitate broader community involvement through the TSP process from other community partners, including public health, transit, the Council of Governments, SCATs, and other allied service providers. I'll second. Thank you. 
So today I wrote out um, a little bit of what I want to share with you. So um, as I stated on the agendas that you have before you, that safe streets are critical for all users, including pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists. Deaths on our roadways are unacceptable and preventable. As we commence the update of our transportation system plan, now is the time to commit to ending what we have come to accept as a byproduct of our society, and that is traffic deaths. Equity and transportation, that is making sure that everyone using our transportation network has what they need in order to get around safely, is something that I'm very passionate about. This is uh, not just about protecting folks who are walking or biking, although they are some of the most at-risk users. This is also about ending deaths from collisions between vehicles and in single car crashes. It is also about ending the trauma of harming or taking the life of another person while using our transportation network. We have functioned under this idea that we are always going to have traffic related deaths. We've come to accept that and not question it, but I firmly believe that through a combination of design, education and enforcement, we will be able to achieve the goal of zero traffic deaths and serious injuries here in Salem. Right now is a perfect time for this goal to be implemented. Our transportation system plan update is in the early stages and we are poised to invest $157 million from our most recent bond in transportation projects. As a council, we are currently looking at reducing speed limits in residential areas with our 20 is plenty program, as well as other traffic calming measures like reevaluating our stop sign policies and the speed bump criteria, which was brought forward by Councillor Gonzalez. Our local climate action plan is ready to tackle the issue of carbon emissions that are generated from our transportation system and new state laws regarding density and walkable, bikeable neighborhoods are working through the planning and implementation process. I also want to take this opportunity to draw attention to the Metropolitan Transportation Safety Action Plan that is being developed under the leadership of the Council of Governments and SCATS. This project is just getting underway, but once it is complete, the Safety Action Plan will meet the requirements to allow Salem and our regional, regional partners to apply for federal funding through the U.S. Department of Transportation's Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program. This plan recommends safety policies and actions as well as goals to measure how they will work. This plan is studying trash data, uh, trash, Lord. This plan will study crash data, analyze safety issues, and talking with the public to make sure that the plan reflects community concerns and experiences. The plan will help guide the investments in our regional roads over the next few years. So as you can see, many people are currently working towards this same goal. And it is only fitting that the Salem City Council join in this good work by voting yes on this motion. I have spoken with city manager Keith Staley and interim public director, uh, public works director Brian Martin about this process and goal and left each of those meetings feeling affirmed that this is doable, it's achievable, and it is the right thing to do. I hope you all will join me in voting yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there other comments? Manager Staley. If, if there are no other council comments, I just would like to say that, yes, we have had a conversation with Councillor Stapleton in regards to this. We do support this action fully. And this morning we were talking about our climate action plan and how we move forward with our climate action plan and safer streets for pedestrians, for cyclists, for motorists is one of the ways that we will be able to advance our climate action plan by making our pedestrian and bicycling infrastructure safer. We make our streets safer. We lower the number of fatalities that are occurring on our streets. People are more comfortable choosing alternative modes. So fully support where we're going tonight. Look forward to this. Thank you, Mr. Staley. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I simply feel like I haven't had enough time to digest this. Um, I've only had this packet since Friday, and it seems like a very broad motion, and I feel like I would be somewhat irresponsible if I didn't understand it better before I voted yes. So it's certainly not that I don't want folks to be safe. Uh, that is my primary goal. But to understand um, things that are put into motion better is important to me. Um, I am curious, uh, what is the current transportation timeline? Are we, is that plan soon to run out or where are we in that? 
Uh, Mr. Martin, would you like to address that? Yes, absolutely. Brian Martin, Acting Public Works Director. We're currently working on the transportation system plan update. Uh, we had a meeting recently on it. It's probably about a three-year process. Uh, this is great timing to uh, advance Councillor Stapleton's motion to incorporate this Vision Zero because it's an element, as everyone has discussed, that will really help mold our transportation systems through the planning process as we go forward. Thank you. And I see uh, one of our transportation, our transportation planner, Julie Warnke, are you wanting to uh, share some thoughts? Hit the mic, please. Thank you. Uh, Julie Warnicke, Transportation Planning Manager with the Public Works Department. And I guess to, to your question, our current transportation system plan is due for a um, sort of a robust update. And that really came to the forefront during the R Salem planning project. So moving into the update of the transportation system plan was has been the goal um, that I've heard from the city council. And we're definitely working towards that. And I agree that incorporating uh, robust safety into this is very appropriate. Other questions or comments? Councillor Nordyke. Uh, thank you. Um, I arrived fully intending to support this motion, and I still want to. I'm wondering if we can help. I remember being a new colleague on council, and when you get these motions, it can feel very overwhelming. So I. It takes a lot of courage to admit that, so my hat is off to you, Councillor Hoy. I'm wondering if maybe a couple more questions might assist with your comfort level with the motion. So when I look at the motion itself, it has four bullet points. Set a clear goal of eliminating traffic deaths, commit to vision zero, and let's see, ask, direct the city staff to be actively engaged in the process of developing the vision zero plan plus implementation, valuation, so on. And then last but not least, facilitate broader community involvement. What, all of these things sound great to me. I'm not seeing a budgetary ask that comes with it. And if I might ask my, my colleague, the maker of the motion to clarify, I think that might help address some of the concerns. Thank you so much. Um, Yes, there is not a budgetary ask here at all. There is conversations that I've had um, with Mr. Martin about, of course, uh, increasing funding for all manner of transportation needs is something that is needed. Um, and we've had those conversations at budget and at finance about um, the city's budget overall. Um, so I am excited about including um, the, the conversation about the safety action plan that is currently being worked on um, by the Council of Governments and SCATs that will allow Salem to actually uh, go for grant funding for some of these projects and, and others that we want to include as well. So um, I am hopeful that, um, that we can actually get some extra funding from these grants. Um, and I'm hopeful as a, as a council that we can help with our budgetary issues overall um, when it comes to the city as a whole, but also our transportation system. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Phillips. So this is more of a just comments um, and appreciation for the motion. Thank you, City Council President uh, Virginia Stapleton for this well-crafted motion. I wish I had submitted it myself, uh, but I appreciate the passion and the bandwidth that you had to work with staff and craft this motion. I think that over time, it really does have the probability of saving lives. So um, I, I'm very clearly, emphatically in favor of it. Um, as an emergency room doctor who's practiced here for the last 15 years and three years of training um, in North Carolina, the worst cases I've ever seen um, have to do with traffic injuries and fatalities. Um, you know, there is no worse part of my job than doing death notifications and the worst ones I've ever done, multiple, have to do with traffic. Um, so I think that this is, is necessary. I think it is beneficial. Um, I think that it may get a bad rap in other communities, but I expect the way that it's crafted with staff's involvement it, that we will get a Salem plan, you know, not a Portland plan or another community plan. And um, really, I think it's, it's a positive step, and I, I look forward to voting yes emphatically. Thank you, Councillor. Other comments? Councillor Gonzalez. You know, I was on the fence about this, even though, you know, um, I helped draft the speed hump issue. My daughter was hit by a car on High Street. You know, I'll share that, especially in these situations, I'll share it. You know, but um, what I, my question is, is the staff, would the staff not do this if we hadn't brought this? Like, 
is the staff not doing this work already? I mean, why would we need to add this layer? Because it sometimes seems like we're creating a program to, uh, to create a program. You know, like we're starting to outsource. It feels like we're starting to outsource this instead of keeping it here at the council with the staff. It seems like there's a subcommittee that gets created by people and then that brings sometimes special interests. You know, so it just always concerns me to take away some power from the city, from the staff. Thank you, Councillor. I, I, I'll give that a shot and then probably turn it over to maybe um, I see Mr. Martin looking like he wants to say something. But I, I think that it's our job to set the direction and give, council, give staff their direction. And I think this would clearly do that. I think it is a, it reemphasizes something that maybe isn't, wasn't emphasized in the current plan that we've had that's been in existence for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. And this would help help them clearly understand where a majority of this council is coming from and where we want to head with that plan. Those are my thoughts. Mr. Martin, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I agree, Mr. Mayor. Um, we are doing bits and pieces of this now, piecemeal. If we were to move forward with this motion, it'll actually bring us together and give us a clearer vision of really uh, setting parameters in place so that we can proactively um, identify the issues, uh, tackle the issues, and then be accountable for tackling those issues. So it's really a way to bring us all together with these bits and pieces and move forward more strategically. Yes, Councillor Gonzalez. But if we don't get zero deaths in 10 years, do we, did we fail? That's, you know, to me the name right away threw me off because I thought it just doesn't seem like the way I would present something. Here we're gonna get to zero. It's just it's not gonna happen. You know, so is it, are we already failing just by admitting this? That's, that's my thought as we go out into the community, telling them we're going to go to net zero. It's impossible. It's impossible. I, I think that Vision, Vision Zero is a national program with a specific, and maybe Ms. Warnicke would like to step forward and talk to us a little bit more about what that means. Because if you're not familiar with what Vision Zero means, and that those sound like two words, but not a program. So maybe, uh, Ms. Warnicke, if you could explain to us a little bit about what that means when Councillor Stapleton says Vision Zero. Uh, once again, Julie Warnicke. Um, yes, Vision Zero, there is a Vision Zero network. Uh, if you do some Googling, you can find out information about it. But really what it's saying is that it's not acceptable for us to have you know, fatalities from traffic. And so while, you know, while we may not get to zero, we need to be aiming for it's not acceptable. So that's the way, the twist I put on it. It's not to say that it will, we're failing if we maybe don't get there in nine years or 10 years, but none of the, those fatalities are acceptable to have in our community. Councilor Gonzalez? Yeah, I mean, I would have agreed with that before. I mean, hopefully everybody did. That's what I'm saying, I'm trying to just, find exactly, because I did go through it. I went through the whole thing that's on their website and it still wasn't clear, I couldn't, it was just like a lot of um, fancy talk. I mean, it was just a lot of words thrown in there, inspirational, and I was like, well, what, give me some real examples of where this could lead to before we send the, the staff on a wild goose chase. Even though I know there's a process, but I couldn't gather from the information that I saw just something clear other than just shooting for zero, which is, I think we should shoot for that Regardless, I, I mean, I do when I drive. I shoot for zero, you know. Thank you, Councillor. I think Councillor Stapleton had some. Did you have a, what? Maybe just the what your motivation is behind this motion. Okay, I didn't know if I had. Thank you, Julie. Um, yes, you know, um, I think about it a lot, like our climate action goal. You know, when we were setting that, um, we had some questions about, you know, is this all just fluff, right? And I think our answer was. As leaders in the community, we should have a clear voice on what we expect and what we want for our community. And that goal is zero deaths on our roadways. And the goal should always be to be there. It would be great if we could get there sooner. Um, we know that there are lots of things in life that, um, that happen, that cause things to happen that are out of our control. But I think the goal should be there and uh, the united voice from council um, directed to staff should be that this should be a priority and, and the goal. Thank you, Councillor. Other questions or comments? Councillor Varney. Thank you very much. Uh, my question was, oh boy, um, yeah, changing a culture is, is difficult, uh, but it's also good to set goals. Uh, 
here it is. The question I had, since it's a national program, uh, if we have a Vision Zero plan, does it make us eligible to apply for additional funding or does it maybe give us more points when we apply for funding with safe routes to schools or parks? Thank you, Councillor. Ms. Warnicke, can you take that one? Um, sure. I believe that in certain um, programs it will. And so as uh, Councillor Stapleton mentioned, the new U.S. Department of Transportation program that's called Safe Streets and Ro Roads for All um, does require a co strong commitment to Vision Zero. Now, I don't think you have to call it Vision Zero, but I think that calling it that helps to draw that attention. Um, our existing transportation plan has for a very long time had a goal of zero deaths from for bicycle and pedestrian fatalities, but it's never had that same focus on um, just people in cars. And so I think this motion would broaden that to cover all modes of transportation. And so some, so yes, I think some it would make a difference. Others maybe we'd get some points. I'm not sure. Thank you, Ms. Warnicke. Councillor Gwynn. So I just want to say, um, Councillor Stapleton, the first time you brought this up, I went I went home and Google searched and tried to figure out everything I could about Vision Zero, and I'm still not clear on what it means and what would change. I, like everyone here, want to see zero deaths. For, I mean, we've, you can look back just a few weeks and we've had several pedestrians hit by cars. Selma Pierce was hit by a car in West Salem, you know, and we all, know and love her you know so no one wants deaths on our roadways i just wish i understood more what vision zero really means um, are we talking speed limits are we talking roundabouts are we talking um, narrower streets i just wish i understood it more I guess that's great. It. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it gets to all of those things. Um, <laughs> when I was speaking with um, Brian Martin about this, you know, there's so many different ways that we can um, design our roads to be safer. Um, and in the past, that hasn't been the main focus. I think the main focus has been about getting people from point A to point B um, as quickly as we can. Um, I would like to shift that focus to being a focus of safety first. Um, and then getting people around. Um, so there are lots of different things that we can do. The 2020 is Plenty program is part of this. Um, the stop signs uh, that we're looking at right now, how we use those, that's part of this. Also the speed humps. All of these different things are part of that. Um, but what this will do is take staff and give them direction that, that as we look at our transportation master plan update, which we're already doing, um, I need them to look through the lens of safety first instead of just getting people from point A to point B as fast as possible. I think, does that, is that accurately said? Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Chair Stapleton, um, I thank you for your passion for this subject. Um, I, I am very much a... I'm a, I'm a result of my circumstances, no matter where I go. And my current circumstances, the priorities aren't in this issue. Um, homelessness is big for me. Deal with it every day in my job and outside my home. And then visiting Wallace Marine Park on Saturday sort of sealed the deal for me. And I have to say, maybe it's just timing but for me to see, when I see and hear Vision Zero, I think homelessness. Let's not have that. Let's direct staff's attention to solving that problem. That's, that's the way my heart feels, so. Other comments? All right, uh, it looks like we're ready to vote. If the recorder will call the roll. Councilor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Enthusiastic aye. Councillor Gwynn. Aye. 
Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Nay. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Varney? Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Mayor Hoy? Aye. Motion passes. All right, on to the polled items from the consent calendar. Councillor Phillips, item 3.3D. Uh, I move staff recommendation to authorize city manager to submit the following two applications to the Oregon Community Paths Program and, if successful, enter into agreements with ODOT to accept funds. Uh, one, construct uh, the Pringle Creek Path connecting under Commercial Street Southeast to Riverfront Park. And two, develop a refinement plan for a pedestrian bridge uh, over uh, Highway 22 east of Lancaster Drive Southeast. Second. <laughs> oh, they were racing for the button there to get the second in. Seconded by Councillor Nordyke. Well done. <laughs> Councillor Phillips, to your motion. Yeah, I pulled this purely uh, for the purposes of highlighting this uh, really cool um, agenda item. Uh, you know, I, I know that uh, this is a big deal for, for Ward 2 and for Ward 3. Um, as both of these pro uh, projects are in Ward 2 or one of them touches Ward 3. So uh, Councillor Anderson is, was a big proponent of the path uh, uh, bridge underneath uh, Commercial Street to connect Riverfront to um, our campus here at City Hall and to uh, which would then connect it to like Bush Park and really create a longitudinal park. So you know seeing that there is great and then as the uh, counselor for Ward 3, I really do hear a lot from the community east of um, I-5 that there is a, a tremendous need for a connection between the north and south sides of um, Highway 22. There's a grade school um, just north of Highway 22 and there's no way for the community that's south of there to get there safely. Um, they either have to go across the Cordon Bridge, uh, which is uh, basically two lanes and then cement barriers that are the guardrail. There's barely enough uh, room there for vehicles to pass each other, let alone bicyclists or pedestrians. And to go all the way around and take um, the Lancaster Drive would add like a mile, mile and a half to that, um, connecting you know kids to that grade school. So this is a big deal. A lot of community members have brought it up um, and I'm really pleased to see us moving forward. Thank you, Councillor. I share your enthusiasm. This is, as a resident of East Salem, this is really important to me. And I know that when Councillor Gonzalez and I visited Colonial uh, Libertad a few months, a couple of months ago, uh, this was a topic of conversation there with the folks who live in that neighborhood. So I know they're really excited about it as well. So thank you for highlighting it. Are there other questions or comments? Councillor Nordyke. Uh, thank you. I too will be supporting the motion for both projects. I also want to point out that although Pringle Creek Path Project is not in my ward, many of my residents from Ward 7 will make that journey from Ward 7 to downtown and back again. Uh, during the pandemic, many of us were working from home, but when we did go into the office for various reasons, a number of people commuted by bicycle or on foot to and from those offices. So the more and more we can do to enhance connectivity and alternatives to driving every place in town, the better. And I would just note that all of that connectivity is why, place, why entities like Iron Man have been coming to Salem, because we now have all these crisscrossing bridges for all kinds of joggers, dog walkers, people pushing strollers and so on. Uh, the concept art is also really gorgeous for Pringle Creek, so I'm really excited to see that come to fruition. And I'll be expecting my golden shovel. Thank you very much. Noted. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and I will just say that in conversations with uh, developers who are considering uh, doing new developments here in town recently, that's been one of the topics of our conversation, both of these paths and both of these crossings. That as a, and things that they've been interested in um, before they invest their money in Salem to know that we're more walkable, bikeable, and that sort of thing. So thank you for highlighting that. Is there any other conversation on this? If the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Gwynn. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. And I'm happy to finish with an aye. <laughs> Mayor Hoy. Aye. <laughs> Motion passes. All right, on to item 3.3F. I move City Council approve the Legislative Committee's recommendation to the 2023 Oregon Legislature to support community rail service, 
commuter rail study proposal to extend TriMet's West Side Express Service commuter line to Salem in the 2023 Oregon Legislative Session. Second. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, to the motion, uh, just um, this is, uh, I think, something that we, many of us, have been talking about for a number of years. We've had conversations with a number of elected officials. We were really pleased when the city of Wilsonville recently contacted us to to uh, kind of join in support of this, and I couldn't be more enthusiastic about the potential for this uh, service, um, with, especially with the potential redevelopment of our north of our downtown area, which is where this line would likely go. I think that the possibilities for our, the redevelopment of our north downtown area are remarkable, and I am very enthusiastic and will do all I can to make sure this thing happens. So I hope you all will support this. Are there other comments? Councillor Nishioka. I just want to say this is fantastic. <laughs> this is really, really exciting. And having commuted to the metro area from Salem for a number of years and having spent many hours sitting on I-5 in Wilsonville, I couldn't, uh, couldn't think of a better thing to support right now. I've spent many hours sitting on the Boone Bridge in traffic, twiddling my thumbs. So, all right, if the recorder will please call the roll. Councillor Gwynn. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Barney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Nishioka. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Mayor Hoy. Aye. Motion passes. And thank you, Mr. Otned, for coming down. And please extend our, th our thanks to the Wilsonville City Council for bringing this forward. We really appreciate it. All right, council, with that, we are on to information reports. Uh, anything on item 6A? How about item 6B? 6C? Any of the inf information reports? Wow, that was quick. That was awesome. No. What? Yes. Just a thank you to staff for bringing that all together for us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, on to uh, ordinances. We have no first readings. We do have a second reading, item 7.2A. Ordinance bill number 123, an ordinance vacating Cross Street Southeast West of 20th Street Southeast. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Nishioka? Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Gwynn? Aye. Mayor Hoy? Aye. Motion passes. Third time's the charm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 7 2 B. Ordinance Bill Number 223, an ordinance amending Ordinance Bill Number 2022, declaring certain territory located at 4650 and 4680 Hazel Green Road Northeast and land adjacent, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing Salem Area Comprehensive Plan Map designation, prescribing zoning, and withdrawing the territory from the Marion County Fire District Number 1. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Varney. Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Nishioka? Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Councillor Gwynn? Aye. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Mayor Hoy? Aye. Motion passes. All right. And we do have a person signed up for public comment under item number eight. So I will call forward Mr. Philip Carver. As a reminder, you have three minutes. Please introduce yourself for the record. The yellow light will flash uh, when you have one minute remaining, and the red light will come on at three minutes. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for your service and the time you spend in serving our community. Um, I, w I uh, watched the meeting of the Climate Action Plan Committee, and it's pretty clear that the amount of time that that's set up for that committee is inadequate. Um, they didn't even get, you didn't get even a chance to discuss the task list, the work plan for the year. And um, so I recommend that you have monthly meetings and make the meeting length um, com compatible with the agenda items um, so that it's, so that I can actually talk about policy and guide staff. Um, the, we were pretty happy with most of the work plan items. Um, transportation looks pretty good. 
Um, and the uh, electricity looks good. And those look like they're, especially electricity, on a really good path to, to get to really low emission levels. The transportation is going to be more challenging, but electrification is going to help there. But on the um, fossil fuels from stationary sources, the plan is really totally inadequate. And there really needs to be a report from the, the big missing opportunity um, is when you build a building to make it right the first time. And it's really clear that we're going to need all the new residential buildings be electric, 100% electric, because the electric system is getting cleaner, but the gas system really cannot become clean. There's not enough biologically available materials for the renewable diesel, for the long distance trucks, for the renewable air, air fuels, jet fuels and other air fuels, and for natural gas. And the hydrogen pathway just is not workable. Um, it's a Rube Goldberg if you take electricity, make hydrogen, and then take the hydrogen to make methane, and then take the methane and put it in pipes to run homes. That's when instead you could just take the electricity to run homes to run very efficient heat pumps. And um, the, the complaints about choice, the, the key thing about choice and government is that, and freedom, which I'm very supportive of, your freedom to swing your arms ends where my nose begins. And this is the climate. This is the most important issue for the, this century. So we really need a study of what we can do about gas heat in new homes. And um, there's in my memo to the committee um, is a recommendation. And I, rec I ask um, city manager Staley and the mayor to have the staff do a study. You don't need a motion for that um, about what to do about what should be done with new homes um, so that we don't create a 50 year problem because um, these homes are going to last 50 to 100 years. Um, thank you for your time. Um, and appreciate all your work you do. Thank you, Mr. Carver. As seeing no other business before us, we are adjourned.